So in this lesson, we're going to solve equations where the unknown or the x is underneath the square root. Now these I've been saving for a while because they're kind of special. And in order to understand how they're special, first, you have to realize one thing about solving equations. When you solve an equation, you don't get the solution. What you get are candidate solutions that may or may not work. Okay. Now, every single equation we've solved so far this year has been pretty simple, either linear or quadratic. And so the candidate issue really hasn't been a problem because the one thing I didn't tell you that now that we're at the end of Algebra 1, I can, solutions only occur in the domain of the associated function. Okay, So your answer for your x has to be within the domain of your original function. For linear and quadratic, because their domains are all reals, you can get whatever real number you want. Now, here's the thing. If you perform an operation like you square both sides or you multiply or divide both sides of an equation by something that changes the domain of the original, you may, not always, but you may create something called an extraneous solution. And what that is, is an answer that works for the transformed version, but not the original version. Okay, and so I'm gonna tell you this right now, just because your answer doesn't work, doesn't mean it's extraneous, all right? I can't tell you how many people on the quadratic tests say, oh, my answer didn't work, therefore it's extraneous. What that means, if you're solving a quadratic and you get an answer that doesn't work, it means your answer's wrong. Not that it's extraneous, that you did something wrong. So you are never going to get an extraneous solution when you are solving a linear or quadratic equation, all right? So if you're solving some linear, something quadratic, you plug it in and it doesn't work, that means you did it wrong. Not that it's extraneous, all right? Extraneous only happens when you have a limited to domain to begin with. Okay, so for example, square roots of x or dividing by x's have limited domains, meaning there are x values that don't work. So in the case of the square root of x, I cannot have a negative number under the radical. So if my solution gives me a negative number under the radical, it does not work. Or if I'm dividing by x or some expression of x, if my answer happens to make my denominator zero, that means it's an extraneous solution. Now we're not gonna talk about the dividing by x's because those are rational functions and we don't do rational functions. We're gonna look at examples with square roots. Starting with the super basic one, the square root of 5x plus 1 equals 6, okay? So right now, this function has a limited domain, and you can figure out what the limited domain is. If you just set that equal to y, and you graph it, you're going to see, well, basically, half of a sideways parabola. So if I have y equals the square root of 5x plus 1, and I graph it, I get half of a sideways parabola. And I go to the table, and I look, hey, there's some errors. And whenever you see an error, that means you have a restricted domain. You just can't plug any old number into this equation, it's gonna work. You can only plug in things that are gonna make sure that the number under the radical is positive, right? And it doesn't start actually at zero, it starts at negative one-fifth, and it's easy enough to find that. Just set that five x plus one uh, equal to zero, and then you can figure out the point where it, which it begins to exist as a domain. And so if I solve this thing, and I get an answer in one of these error places here, that means my answer was extraneous, all right? So let's solve it and see if I get an extraneous answer or an answer that works. So I'm gonna use opposite operations, and I have the square root of 5x plus one, and to undo square roots, I have to square both sides, and so I get 5x plus one equals 36, okay? So here's the difference between these two equations. Yeah, I did the same thing to both sides. This thing has a limited domain. This thing is linear and has an all real domain. So the domain changed when I squared both sides. And so when I solve this equation, 5x plus 1 equals 36, it's something that can be any real number, but the original couldn't be any real number. It can only be numbers that are greater than negative 1 fifth. And so I just go through and solve 5x 
5x equals 35, x equals 7. Now remember, this is just a candidate solution, not necessarily the solution. I must plug it in and check. And what I'm checking for is if it makes this expression work. So if I plug in 7, 5 times 7 plus 1 does it equal 6. And so I get 36 equals 6 and 6 equals 6. So yay, I've checked it. Therefore, 7 is not only the candidate, but it actually is my solution. Okay, now square root equations can be a little bit tricky because you have to understand the notation. If you just go through the process of squaring both sides in this case, you're going to do a lot of unnecessary work. And I'll show you why. Okay, so I'm going to square both sides and I get 3x plus 4 equals 64. And I go ahead and solve it and I get 3x equals 60 and then x equals 20. And I go back, remember this is a candidate, that is my candidate, and I must check it because it might be extraneous. And so then I do 3 times 20 plus 4 equals negative 8, and then I get the square root of 64 equals negative 8, and the square root of 64 is 8, not negative 8. So therefore, my solution is that there isn't one. And that this 20 that I got was actually extraneous. Now I could have figured that out from the very beginning if I remember the notation with radicals. Because remember, if I just see a radical like that, it's telling me I want the principal root, which is the positive one, and it was equal to some negative number, which is not true. In order for this equation to work and for that 20 to be a solution, I need a negative sign out in front of that square root of 3x plus 4, or I need that 8 to be positive. So now let's solve this equation. Notice it's a little bit different. There's a square root on both sides, and in order to deal with the square root on both sides, you just square both sides. Pretty straightforward. And I get left with 7x equals x minus 12. And so I have an equation with unknowns on both sides. 6x equals negative 12, and then therefore x equals negative 2. And this is my candidate. Now, now just because x is negative doesn't mean it's automatically extraneous. I have to check it because sometimes negative numbers will turn out to be positive inside the radical. So in this case, let's check it. So I have the square root of 7 times negative 2 equals the square root of negative 2 minus 12. And I get the square root of negative 14 equals the square root of negative 14. And you want to say, oh, hey, that totally works. The square root of negative 14 is totally equal to the square root of negative 14. But I cannot have a negative under the radical, so this actually is extraneous. Had that turned out to be positive 14 and positive 14, then that's totally the solution. But it's not. It doesn't say that. So my solution actually is the empty set, and negative 2 is extraneous. And that's actually part of my answer, too. Now you have to be careful with these square root equations. Um, you want to make sure, first and foremost, that your square root is isolated on one side of the equation. Because if you were to just square both sides here, you're actually not going to get rid of the square root. So let me just show you if um, here's the wrong way. Don't just square it as you see it. Because if you square this thing, you're squaring this expression, which is a binomial, which means you have to use FOIL, right? You have to do the 5 root 4x minus 8 times 5 root 4x minus 8 equals 12 squared. And then so you get 5 times is 25 times 4x and then minus 4 40 root 4x minus 40 root 4x plus 64 equals 144. Uh, what you just did here is I made everything worse. So frowny face. It is now worse. And that's the one thing about radical equations, other than having to check the answer, is that if you aren't careful, you won't make your life easier. You'll actually make your life harder. So instead, what you want to do is you want to isolate, if possible, the square root.
Okay. Now it's not always possible. When you get to Algebra 2 and you're going to learn about these things called conic sections, there comes a point when you actually can't isolate the square root in the very beginning and you're actually going to have to do something like that. Now that's Algebra 2. We're in Algebra 1. We're not doing that. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get the square root by itself by using my pose. So I want to add 8 to both sides. So I get 5 root 4x equals, whoopsie, that's supposed to be 12. I already added 8, and I get 20, right? Because if you add 8 to 12, you get 20. And then I'm going to divide both sides by 4, or by 5, sorry. And I get root 4x equals 4. And now you have an equation that's super easy to square both sides. So you get 4x equals 16, and x equals 4 as your candidate, right? And then, of course, you have to go back and check with the original. So is 5 times the square root of 4 times 4 minus 8, does that equal 12? Question mark. So 5 times 4 is 20 minus 8 is 12. And yes, indeed, 12 equals 12. So my solution is the set containing 4. So you may be asking yourself, well, hey, why didn't we just solve those when we were talking about square roots? Because it's not like that would have been so difficult. Well, here's the reason why we save solving square root equations. Because if you look at this one, I have an x under the radical and I have an x outside the radical. So when I square both sides, I get 5x plus 6 on this side and an x squared on that side, which gives me a quadratic. So we had to wait until after quadratics in order to do this because sometimes you actually get a quadratic left over. And so now what I have to do is to solve this quadratic. And you could pick your method. I'm just going to make it look right first, so minus 5x minus 6. And for me, I'm a fan of factoring, so I'm going to try to factor this thing. And I'm looking for factors of negative 6 that add to negative 5 and they happen to be negative 6 and positive 1. So I get x minus 6 and x plus 1 equals 0. So therefore, I can use my zero product property, and by the zero product property, I get x minus 6 equals 0, or x plus 1 equals 0, so a 6 or a negative 1. Now these are my candidates. They aren't the solution. They are candidate solutions, so I need to check. And I have two to check this time because it was quadratic. So I'm going to check 6 first. So I have the square root of 5 times 6 plus 6, and does that equal 6? Question mark. So I get square root of 36 equals 6, and 6 equals 6, so yay. So now let's check negative 1. And so I'm looking for 5 times negative 1 plus 6. So I get square root of negative 5 plus 6, which is a square root of 1, which equals 1, not negative 1, which does not work, so frowny face. So my solution is the set containing 6, and negative 1 was extraneous. Now, I didn't have to actually check it by plugging it in to know this was going to work, because, once again, this is asking for the positive or principal root, so x had to be positive. Now. I can make this into a different equation, a different problem, by adding on a little negative sign. If I put the negative sign either out here or outside of the x, then what happens is that these two numbers switch. Negative 1 becomes the member of the solution set, and 6 becomes extraneous because in this case, when I put the negative sign out front, I want the negative version of the answer. So look very carefully at your notation to make sure that you are doing, giving me the correct member of the solution set. And now finally for your check, I want you to solve these three equations. Square root of 2x plus 3 plus 8 equals 2. Square root of 4x minus 7 equals the square root of x plus 5 and the square root of x plus 6 equals x. And be sure to state any extraneous solutions you may get.